Hola, amigos. Tudo bem? My name is Zenon Kaplan. I'm the founder and director of Kaplan Asia. We are a Asia-focused market research and consulting company based here in Shanghai, China. Today, I want to tell you about the 10 things that you need to know about fintech in China. Number one, it's big. It's bigger than anywhere else in the world. Fintech has been talked about for many years, but really the scale in terms of valuations, in terms of transactions, in any measure, is bigger here in China than anywhere else in the world. Here in China, you have over 800 million people that are using a chat app that also includes payments. Some of the biggest fintech unicorns like Ant Financial, Lufax, are coming from the Chinese market. That's number one. The second thing is, it all started with payments. Back in 2004, when Taobao launched, most of the e-commerce transactions were settled in cash. So you would order something online, the delivery person would deliver it, and you would pay them in cash for the transactions. Now there's a lot of challenges in that equation. First of all, the buyer could try and defraud the seller. The seller could defraud the buyer. There wasn't a lot of trust. And so Alibaba at the time created a platform called Alipay. Alipay was initially designed to be an online platform for making payments for e-commerce transactions. You would order something online, pay for it immediately, and then the money would sit in escrow for two weeks. If you were satisfied with the purchase, you would just say, satisfied, and the money would be released to the merchant. If you said nothing, after two weeks, the money would be released automatically. What started off at mobile payments has really changed the nature of fintech here in China, and it all started with that need to provide trust in e-commerce transactions. The third thing you need to know about fintech in China is that it's the tech companies that are leading the way. Unlike the financial institutions, the tech companies aren't limited by the same requirements of balance sheets and, and having specific business models. The tech giants here in China, like Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, are tech companies that are looking to create new innovations in the market. Originally, as I mentioned before, Alibaba got into the market by providing online payments. But they saw the opportunity. They saw the opportunity to make money, to collect data, and collect information about customers and clients to create an entire view of what consumers were looking for in their financial relationships. It's these tech companies that are driving the change in China. The fourth thing is wealth management. So once Alibaba set up Alipay, they started to notice that people were leaving money on their digital wallets. To provide them a way of getting a return from that, they launched a product called Yuabao. Yuabao was just a wealth management product that was based on the interbank lending market. At the time, for overnight lending between banks, it was about 10% that banks needed to pay. So Alibaba created a financial product that paid consumers, retail consumers, 7%. When you consider that average deposits in a bank would be paying 3 or 4%, percent is a big difference. People started using this platform, this UAL platform, and within a couple of years, it became the largest asset management product in the world. The thing that was very attractive about it is it's nearly instant. So you could be sitting on your phone on the metro today, decide that you want to invest 100 RMB into the UofL fund. Starting tomorrow, you gain interest on that money, and you gain daily interest. So for a very low amount, you're able to get involved in wealth management and get a return almost immediately. Also, you can take your money out almost immediately as well. The liquidity on these platforms is amazing. If I withdrew my money now, I would get it to my bank account two hours from now. When you consider what was happening before in wealth management in China, if you wanted to buy a product from the bank, you typically had to go to the bank. It was typically a lock-in period, like any other wealth management or time deposit project product of 10 days, 30 days, 60 days. So it's very difficult for a lot of people to get involved in this with the high minimums and the high lock-in times. You have now effectively democratized wealth management in China, which meant that for as little as one renminbi, only a couple of cents, you can invest in a wealth management product. And that opened up wealth management to an entirely new segment of people here in China. The fifth thing you need to know about fintech in China is the approach of the regulators. The regulators recognize that a lot of these platforms provide a lot of goodness, not just for the financial industry, but for China's economy in general. If you think about the state-owned banks here in China, many of them are huge, and they tend to lend to other state-owned enterprises. So PetroChina, China's biggest gas and oil company, or Costco, a large shipping company here in China. Not a lot of that funding goes to individuals or small medium enterprises. The government recognized this. 
a lot of these new fintech platforms were specifically focused on lending to those individuals that otherwise would have had trouble getting credit or getting lending from traditional financial institutions. So the governments let them grow. For something like mobile payments, we've done many studies of people that are living in faraway places in China that are able to set up their own business just using a mobile phone. Their bank may be 100 miles away, but their phone is right there. And they can provide themselves new economic opportunities, economic opportunities that weren't there before. So the government has had what we call a wait and see approach to fintech in China. They've allowed these fintech platforms to grow and only started to ring fence them when they started to get a little bit beyond the scale of what the government was comfortable with, because they recognized that they had value for the market. They can provide that liquidity, they can provide that economic opportunity for individuals and small medium enterprises that wasn't there before. The sixth thing you need to know about fintech in China is it's no longer about the fees. When you look at a traditional credit card business or a banking business, the institutions typically rely on fee-based income. Now it's all about data. When you have a platform like Ant Finance and Alibay that's collecting data on the bike that you're riding every day, the Uber-like car hailing services that you're using, the food that you're ordering, the payments that you're making, it gives them an incredibly large amount of data on you, the retail consumer. On the back of that, they can provide additional products and services, not just financial products and services, but to make your life easier. But we're moving to the idea of situational finance, which is the ability to provide the right product at the right time to the right person. Increasingly, it's not about the fees that people make from the payments, from the banks or from these third-party payment companies. It's more about the data that they can collect around the customer to provide a better experience and to cross-sell and upsell these products into the future. The seventh thing you need to know about FinTech in China is that big data is key. We've always talked about big data and for the past 20 years it's been a topic within the financial industry. When can we use it? How are we going to use it? How are we going to be able to leverage it? We're seeing that today here in China. For all of the reasons that I mentioned before, the, the idea of situational finance is so powerful here in the market here in China because people are on their phones all the time. 75% smartphone penetration in most areas in China means that their smartphone is the primary device that they use on a daily basis. And increasingly, this isn't just for chatting with friends or playing games, it's for balancing their finances, for making payments to friends, for investing in wealth management products, or even buying insurance. And that big data on the back end that these companies are collecting, analyzing, and acting on is critical for the future of fintech, not just here in China, but globally. The eighth thing you need to know about fintech in China is it's getting money where it needs to go. Such a big part of China's growth and economic story is around small medium enterprises. But these are the same companies that are struggling to get financing. The PBOC, the People's Bank of China, is the national central bank here in China. They have credit data on about 800 million people. The population of China is nearly double that. That means there's a lack of credit information in people that are covered by the central credit database. In addition, of those 800 million people, only 400 million actually have transactions behind their name. Me, as, a, as somebody who grew up in the States when I was young, I've had multiple credit cards since I was very young and had a huge credit history on the back of that. So it's much easier for banks to make decisions about my credit rating and whether they should give me money or not. Here in China, it's a lot more challenging. And so these third-party platforms like Ant Financial and Tencent are creating credit rating systems that allow these third-party companies to make an assessment about who should get credit and who shouldn't. It's just something that the banks and the traditional financial industry here in China aren't equipped for because they don't have that level of data and insight. What this allows the companies to do is provide financing to the people that need it the most, the individuals and the small medium enterprises that otherwise wouldn't be able to get capital here in China. And so FinTech is really opening up those doors and allowing these companies to grow in a way that they weren't able to grow before. The ninth thing you need to know about FinTech in China is that Although there are certain conditions that happen here in China, what's happening here could happen anywhere. China tends to move on its own speed, so it's very fast and moving forward very quickly. Technology innovation here has really moved beyond what it is in any other market. But the disruption that's happening here to the financial industry is something that could be happening in Brazil, in the US, or any other financial industry market around the world. What's the most interesting thing here in China is we get to see it today. We get to see the future of QR codes, the future of lending, the future of wealth management, it's all happening here in China, and it's all happening right now. The 10th thing 
Veni para China para ver el futuro de Fintech.